Welcome to uh, uh, day two here at Creative Week. We're having a wonderful time in, in Brooklyn and we're very glad to see you. You uh, have chosen to spend the next hour or so of your time very wisely. Um, when we set out to curate, I'm Matt Schechner, I'm the curator of Creative Week among other various and sundry hats. And um, when we set out to curate this program, um, we felt it was a real challenge to have something in New York call Creative Week and live up to that billing. And there are lots of factors that go into what we do and how we, we build the whole, you know, piece the whole puzzle together. One of them is the where, the places where we choose to do things. So you'll never see anything at Creative Week or Advertising Week, which we do in the fall at the Sheraton. You know, we like places like this. And I'm glad no one's fallen in the water, I think, yet. Um, and of course, the construct of the program and the people that are on stage. Um, some of that also comes through the folks that um, we choose to partner with and more importantly that choose to partner with us. So one of the first phone, phone calls that we made was to our great friends at Adobe, Ann Loons and John Travis and Jeff Mackley and the whole team there at Adobe. And they are among the companies that in the creative arena that we all play in are really in a most meaningful way leading the way forward. Um, so we were thrilled, Michael, to have you um, yesterday with us. Um, last night, Adobe hosted a wonderful reception at the AIGA space on Fifth Avenue, which is a really, really beautiful little gallery. Um, and it's all part of a very exciting release that Adobe has. You may have seen full page ads in the papers the last couple days around their uh, next version of the Creative Cloud, which is very, very exciting um, as well. We're thrilled to have all of you here. We've got one of the many wonderful shops that are headquartered right here in Dumbo uh, with us, with Michael two, and his two. team. Oh, two, two, We're forgive me. same building across the street. There you go, learn something new every day. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, so we made a big bet on Dumbo and coming down here and we're uh, thrilled to be here. So thank, uh, nice, I didn't know that, that's great. Um, and Michael, great to see you. Noah, thanks, Fast Company is one of our uh, dear and dear friends and media partners with us. So thanks to you, Noah, and Christine, and Amy, and Bob, and Tracy, the whole gang. Um, and with that, please enjoy the next hour or so. Thank you. Thanks. Hi, good morning, everyone. Thanks for coming. Um, I'm Noah Robichon, executive editor of Fast Company. Before we start today, I, was, I, I wanted to do something that was a little unplanned because we're all, um, we're all thinking about the death of Maurice Sendak, who died at 83, and, and he was a huge creative influence on. I know everybody sitting here as well as me and probably a lot of you out in the audience. So before I get to talking about the state of Create and we get into the main topic today, I just wanted to spend a minute to recognize his passing and ask, these talented folks, what influence he had on them and, and how he has shaped creativity as we know it today a little bit. So um, would you just briefly introduce yourselves while you, while you go in it? And Michael, why don't you start sure. down there? I'm Michael Levowitz. I'm founder and CEO of Big Spaceship across the street. And uh, wow, Maurice Sendak, he, uh, <coughs> I mean, you know, I, uh, I'm about to turn 40, which is scary. And, um, so I think he pretty much occupied most of my childhood. What? We're <laughs> laughing at the about to turn 40. Come on, when you were about to turn 40, it was scary for you too. I don't um, remember. <laughs> <laughs> um, you know, I mean, I, I think of him as being kind of uh, tremendously fearless and also doing something that's incredibly difficult in uh, in any kind of creative output, which is finding a perfect sort of equilibrium of, uh, of brave and appropriate sort of, uh, he knew exactly how to create for children and challenge them and not be uh, sort of watered down in Disney, um, but actually be both uh, sort of beautiful, challenging, um, a little bit out there. Um, my my five-year-old son thinks, uh, thinks that some of the stuff in his books is very funny. We were talking before that he'd, he'd never shied away from showing penises, um, which to my five-year-old is extremely funny, so, um, and, and to me. Um, so I, I don't know, I mean, I guess, you know, I think it's telling uh, that I am showing Sendak's books and reading his poetry, and I have the old vinyl record of where the sidewalk ends. And Shel uh, Silverstein. Yeah. Oh, that's Shel Silverstein. Yeah, yeah. Right. <laughs> Whoa. I just did a. Yes. Well, let's move on then. <laughs> right. Uh, yeah. I'm still showing those books to my son, and uh, 
and uh, nothing really has sort of stepped up to replace it yeah. since. Michael Goff, uh, I run the experience design team at Adobe. Uh, we design the products, so all those things you don't like about our products, it's my fault. Um, Marie Sendek was said, uh, and this was in the 60s, but I used to copy his illustrations. Uh, I bought a rapidograph pen. I had to work with my parents to figure out what a rapidograph was and how to fill it and how to use it, but I wanted that exact same line. And I copied his illustrations for years. That's what convinced me that drawing was important. I didn't know I was going to try to be creative, and you're not very creative when you're copying people's drawings. But it was a good start. So he's been an inspiration uh, for me and for my family. There was also a quote you, you mentioned upstairs uh, that he had said. What was it about music, writing about music? Oh, he didn't say that. Oh, he didn't oh. say oh, I thought that was, no. I thought that, I thought you were Just about totally him, apropos to our panel. Um, uh, okay, we'll come back to yeah, it. Yeah, we'll come back to it. Bonnie? Okay. Um, I'm Bonnie Siegler. I own a design studio called Eight and a Half. It was formerly number 17 and relaunched as Eight and a Half. And um, Maurice Sendak, um, I love, I mean, just the name, Where the Wild Things Are. Any other children's book author, it would have been The Wild Things. Like, that's what all children's, but just that he inverted the words in that amazing way. You can't, it's just fun to say. Also, he didn't think he was writing children's books. He never wrote for children. He wasn't thinking about speaking to children. And I think that's why, there's one of the reasons why they're so awesome. He wasn't talking down in any way. He wasn't simplifying. This was the story he wanted to tell. Um, and if you haven't seen the Stephen Colbert interview with him, which is less than, it was like three months ago or yeah. something. It's so phenomenal. He's so smart. And he, he's, he like really stands up to Colbert and it's really fun. Good. Okay, so let's get back to the state of Create, um, having recognized the passing of that great man. Um, creativity, it's imagination made real, it's a work of art, a way of life, passion, beauty, renaissance man as God, it's a lol cat, but that's actually not the creativity we're here to talk about today. This panel is about the other creativity, the one where you have to work really hard and do the same thing over and over again for years until you uh, stop getting it wrong, basically. Um, and it's about building a space where the people who work with you uh, and who you work for can be creative. It's also about fostering dialogue so that a client thinks that it was their great idea all along. Um, I'm not really talking about the creative process as much as the process required to get to a place where business can be creative. And that's what uh, Fast Company spent a lot of time writing about lately. Uh, it turns out that today's in today's business, creativity is a key factor in success. You look at companies like Nike, which has a designer uh, as a CEO. You look at the success of Apple and the recognition that Steve Jobs really cared about creativity and design. Um, design thinking has no longer sort of been uh, ghettoized in the R&D lab, right? It's being invi invited into the boardroom more and more. That's what we're seeing. So we're also seeing that people in general uh, are starting to think of themselves as creative and they want to be more creative. Um, there was our sponsor Adobe did a, did a, uh, a study about a, a global study that found that 80% of people think that unlocking creativity is critical to economic growth. So our panel today represents a range of different approaches to creativity and business. Um, from Adobe, which has around 9,000 employees, to a uh, big spaceship, which I think you said had 55, right? Yep. And, and, and Bonnie, you had, I'd say, six people at eight and a half yesterday. Was that, is that about right? Yep. Okay, great. <laughs> So, so the first thing I wanted to talk about is your different approaches to how you structure your teams to foster creativity. Um, Bonnie, you want to start with talking about sort of you know what you what you how you get creativity on a day-to-day -day basis, basically within your office, within that small space. I mean, I don't even think of it as getting creativity. You know, we have problems to solve, and we all work in service of the best idea. And everybody wants to have the best idea, but we're equally excited by somebody with a better idea. So, and it's, and then we all build on it and, and, but it's that drive to always, you know, make it great. I mean, we're all serving the same goal, so. But, but in terms of the disciplines, do you have people who are, you know, producers, people who are artists? In other words, how do they, how do you find the different disciplines or is everybody in your office basically, they're, they do everything? Everybody does everything in my office. And sometimes even the, you know, when, we, when we're brainstorming for things like naming a restaurant or something like that, and we invite 
you know, the receptionist will come up with a list of names. Everybody will come up with a list of names because you never know where a good idea is going to come from and one person's idea sparks another person's idea that, you know, a direction that they hadn't thought about before. So we're all, I mean, it's, it's so much fun. It's just a game. Yeah, interesting. So, Michael, a big spaceship getting to the next size up in terms of uh, a company, how do you... <laughs> Laura, your biggest. How, how do you how do you you know how do you organize teams? You have a very specific way of, of sort of structuring groups, I think. Yeah, um, I mean, I think that uh, that sort of unlocking creativity. I think everybody's creative. I think I said yesterday, everybody's born creative. If you have kids, you know this. Um, but uh, but the long process of school and the corporate world, if you're unfortunate enough to end up there, will will beat it out of you. Not Adobe, of course. Um, and uh, and so you know, unlocking it is mostly, in my opinion, it's organizational. Mm -hmm. um, the people's conception of work, not even necessarily their reality of work, but you know, if you watch the Flintstones. You know, Fred Flintstone's boss is a loudmouth who yells at him. You know, that, that we're, we're sort of acculturated to that sense of, of, of work and of business. And I think, you know, it takes a little bit of kind of deprogramming <laughs> to get to a place where people can feel comfortable and be themselves in the workplace. Um, so uh, I think there's a lot of sort of structural, organizational things that you can do to help help uh, achieve that. So what we tell, go yeah, ahead. Tell, tell me specifically about, about sort of when you're working on a project, who you bring to a team, you know, what, what disciplines you bring together and, and how you how do you tell them to work on something? In other words, what's the what's the goal? Sure. How do you how do you get them to produce? Well we don't form based on projects. So we have fixed cross disciplinary teams. So our four core disciplines of Big Spaceship are strategy, design, production and technology. We have fixed teams uh, of that are all uh, that represent all of those disciplines and they work together consistently over time until such time as we shuffle teams if we add a new one we make sure that they're not all noobs on one team so we shuffle them around but they have a commitment from us that the team will be pretty consistent for uh, for a length of time and they'll work on anything that comes their way together and the the reason for that there are several reasons for it one is um, it it relieves us from having to impose a sort of empirical work process downwards from the top. Uh, you know, at its best, it, that will that kind of a process will extract talent from some people, but equally talented people who don't sort of adapt to that particular process won't. You won't get as much out of them. They won't feel as uh, as empowered by it. But we have, let's say, six teams. Uh, th they can come up with their own processes. They, we get efficiency not from trying to create sort of the assembly line approach, but instead by letting these people learn how each other work and begin to trust each other uh, that way because they know that by working together over time, I think we all know by working together over time, you learn that team telepathy uh, and you know how somebody else wants to receive their files. I mean, really mm -hmm. simple things. Um, the, the other thing is we give the teams a framework. Um, so tons of autonomy. Uh, the framework is five things. Take care of each other, collaborate, produce work of excellence, partner with your client, and be profitable. And beyond that, I don't really give a fuck how they get the work done. Um, it's not, I'm not assembling people based on a particular type of work. I, I like to believe that I could give the same brief to six teams and I would get equally high quality results, although they would be wildly different. Mm -hmm. um, but I think, you know, autonomy, empowerment, um, a lot of groups, a lot of agencies will sort of uh, do plug and play resourcing of things. So you'll have, uh, I have two hours of design need over here. I have a designer free and I'll plug them in, which is pretty much commodifying your own talent. Uh, you know, that, that leads to no interest on the part of the designer because they have nothing to show for two hours worth of design, no passion, and it doesn't bring anything to the end product because no institutional knowledge or passion was brought to it. So we're trying to sort of subvert that. Interesting. 
So, uh, Michael Goff, uh, talk to us about how Adobe, you, you address the team, I mean, you've got a much bigger group of people that, that you work with on a day-to-day -day basis. How do, you, how do you foster creativity there? How do, you, um, how do you get folks to sort of bring, you know, bring that to the table and get away from the, the, you know, the structure, the over, the, the too much structure that can, can sometimes come from a big organization? So first off, I never mention the word creativity. Uh, to my team or to the people around my team. And every time our uh, ops team uh, tells the company to be innovative, I flip out. <laughs> um, our problem is around alignment. Uh, it's not around uh, great ideas. There's 10,000 people now. Um, and if 10,000 people have great ideas, you end up with utter crap. Uh, so most of the focus of our team is around constantly working on getting everybody moving in the same direction focused on the same problem. Unlike uh, an agency where you get a, a large diversity of projects, I'm trying really hard to convince people they're only working on one thing, and that's that overall experience. We're trying to gather all those different projects and bring them together. This uh, rests pretty heavily on what I learned as an architect. Uh, the better an architecture firm is, the more they really just have one way of uh, practicing uh, their trade, and you get better and better at that over time. Uh, I, we were talking earlier about Geary's firm. If you want to work for Frank Geary, you just spent your undergraduate uh, life and your graduate life in school only drawing Geary buildings, only trying to figure out what it is that makes that work special, what motivates it, um, you know, what, are, what is, are his parties, what are his big moves, and that's what I would like to instill at Adobe. It's not easy. We're like 100 people, which seems like a lot, but it's 100 in an organization of 10,000. And uh, there are 9,900 people who don't think like designers think. Uh, the, that way of thinking, and we can call that creativity or we can call it whatever we want, is powerful. It's useful. Um, but it does tend to have a hard time uh, finding its voice uh, in what is essentially a contrarian environment. Um, but the one thing we can do is, if it's 100 people speaking with the same voice, God, that sounds like a platitude, um, it can make a real difference. Like, if you're not defending your idea, you're defending XD's or Adobe's experience model, uh, it's a completely different equation. Um, the, big, the most important thing, especially about training young people to think about creativity um, or to think about design, is to keep reminding them that it's 99.9% .9 just hard work. Just do the task. Focus on the craft. The ideas just kind of come. Um, you don't have to worry about them that much. But if what you do is obsessively working, uh, worry about having a great idea, then you get into that thing. You're like waiting for the angel to park on your shoulder and whisper <laughs> in your ear. Um, and we just don't have the time to wait. So yeah. just do the work. Now, that's interesting. That's something I heard from all of you that, that it's, it is about this constantly going back to the work again and again and you, you almost don't think of yourselves as in a creative business or day to day. It's not like you're thinking, Let's be, how am I going to be creative today? How are we going to be creative today? But at the same time, you have all, I'd say, I, I think it was in the last year, taken part in sort of, um, I don't know how to phrase it, maybe a creative hackathon of some sort where you sort of said like, we're going to spend, you know, we're going to all get together and figure out how to fix a problem, right? Or something like that with the output being essentially new creative work. So I wanted you to each talk about what that was and how it was, how it was organized and, and what you got out of that event. So, so um, Michael, can you actually start again with talking about the, the I believe it was called the, the, cloud, um, the cloud kickoff was what mm -hmm. it was called? Yeah, so about a year and a half ago, uh, we got a bunch of people out of the office. Uh, we went to Cavallo, which is this amazing state-run, it's a converted uh, military base. Mm -hmm. um, we did a retreat around uh, Adobe's move into the cloud. It's kind of an obvious thing to do. There's little cloud logos in, on everybody's, uh, well, at least every corporation's site now. Uh, but moving in the cloud meant a lot to us as a company, um, was hard. Uh, radical change. It, so if we have, say, 6,000 C coders who build desktop applications, telling them that we're going to start uh, working on web applications and we're going to start uh, putting most of our stuff on servers was a huge challenge. Uh, so we did take people out of the office. We did all the classic stuff through Frisbees and everything. But more importantly, we came there with a pretty clear vision um, that we, 
leaked out over the two days of what Creative Cloud would be like. Um, so that had already been pretty much fully formed. We were trying to get alignment around that project less than come up with what that project should be in that environment. Doesn't mean I'm not uh, opposed to. We do little hackathons. We have mm -hmm. little events all the time. And sometimes great ideas come out of them. Um, but it's more the exception than the rule. And we have, I have to admit, we do it more for PR purposes than anything else. If people are feeling a little stuck and uncreative in their regular job, which I need them yeah. to do, um, mm -hmm. then give them a chance to go off and do uh, some other project that makes them freeze up, them up a little bit, uh, expands their mind a little bit, and then get them back to the drudgery of their day-to-day -day job. <laughs> Bonnie, you want to talk about, you did one with students, I know, but you also, yeah. uh, it feels like you do this a lot from the sound of it, just within your office. It's um, true. It's a, I mean, in it. the office, it's a, the, the, but the one with, um, it wasn't students, it was people 22 to 26. Can I talk about the game show? Oh, yeah. So right. it's, a, it's a game show for the AIGA. It happens every other year, and, and we choose seven contestants. And it was sort of a way to expose younger people at these design conferences younger people under 30 never are on stage. They never see themselves. It's never a reflection of them. It's just what they could be one day. So it was sort of a way to bring them into the conference. And so there's seven contestants and they have to do whole projects in 24 hours in a public space. So people come up to them and give them advice, but they achieved more than they ever thought was possible. Each of them in these day-long projects. What, what was the mandate? What, was, what were they asked to do in uh, that project? One, one project was to redesign the Arizona iced tea packaging and then stand up in front of 3,000 people and defend what they did and why they did it. Mm. And not, not only did they have to come up with the idea and execute the idea, but you know, fairly famous graphic designers would come up to them and say, uh, I definitely think you should make it blue. And then another one would come up and say, actually, green is the way to go. <laughs> and they'd have to, like an art director, go through various ideas and figure out what's the best one. And, and so it, just by telling them they could do it, they did it. It was really incredible. They all crying about how they never thought they could. It was, but it was so inspiring to watch these people be given that opportunity and rise to the task. And, and what was the outcome? I mean, I mean, talk about the work that resulted from it. Was, it. was it work that actually did anything or was it just really about them gaining confidence and being able to take that? Well, they were prizes. No um. prizes. But I, mean, I, wanted to, I mean, the work. Like, what was the work any good? It was. It was really good. And, and one year, the, the task was to get people, well, you know when, um, to vote. And one girl did a project that was incredible. She also got 500 job offers. But she wow. came up with a campaign that went viral to get people to vote about how your opinion doesn't matter if you don't vote. Nobody cares what you think, you who doesn't vote. And it was, it was really powerful. So that actually left the conference and, and went on and had a life of its own. Yeah, interesting. Michael, you want to talk about, uh, you did one internally for Big Spaceship. Yeah, yeah, we just, um, we just did one last week, our first. And um, <clears throat> it was sort of ostensibly to kick off, I did a sort of a refinement to our team system to make it more uh, agile and sort of nimble, and uh, we. I, well, I also wanted every single person in the company to have a new seat, so we moved everybody around because I wanted them to have a new perspective and uh, and maybe clean up a little bit along the way, <laughs> and um, and so we kicked this off this new organization with uh, a hack day. So 9:30 last Tuesday morning, um, I briefed uh, eight teams. Uh, the teams were approximately four people, one from each discipline, strategy, design, producer, and, uh, and technologist. And uh, I gave them, I think they were expecting a much more specific brief, and I intentionally did a very sort of loose scaffolding. It was basically uh, by 9.30 the next morning, they had to produce a prototype of something, along with a 10-minute presentation about mm -hmm. it, that was uh, deployed primarily mobile and tablet, that was for a very particular audience, although I wouldn't say who, just they had to choose an audience that wasn't more than just like all women or something mm -hmm. like that. And, um, and they, uh, they had to have a very firm, uh, strong reason for it to exist, um, and what I said was usually uh, that in this sort of world of creating little startups and software is money, but if it wasn't more power to them. 
and, uh, and go. And they took off. I, I wandered around and we were filming the whole thing uh, just to sort of get a sense of it and we're going to produce some little thing out of it. But um, I got to sort of speak with each team, uh, sort of help them along the way. They were mostly asking me questions. I was trying not to sort of give too specific answers because I wanted to see them. But what was amazing and validating was my whole thing about how there could be uh, any number of processes. And really they all sort of, they had, they each came up with a process for getting this really challenging uh, uh, proposition done uh, that reflected their personalities as a team. And, uh, and for me, very selfishly, I wanted to be able to benchmark kind of what are we capable of as a company in 24 hours. Um, and what resulted was, I mean, it far exceeded my expectations. I, I, I sort of agree that, uh, that everybody kind of realized their own tremendous power in the world. Uh, they, I think everybody impressed themselves, they impressed each other. We did 9.30 the next morning, some very, very sleepy people, but, um, but the presentations were incredible. Most of the teams had not seen the other ideas, and so it was sort of a big surprise, and then everyone got to rank their favorite top three. There were some prizes for the top team, but most of the prizes were kind of soft, like you can choose your own seat and boot anybody out. Uh, so, uh, sort of cultural rewards. Um, and, uh, and then the sort of top three ideas, although I think several more will make it, are going to go into sort of our IP practice where we're actually going to take them to the next level and, uh, and try to roll them out into the world in some form or another. Um, but the, the, the winning project was fully functional. Uh, the, the technologist who worked on it was there till five in the morning using two technologies he'd never used before uh, to solve the problem, but it was fully functional. We used it during their presentation. They set us up with it and, uh, you know, it's ready to go. We could, we could pitch it to someone today uh, in 24 hours. So the, the level of, uh, of kind of excitement that they feel coming out of that is incredible. I've never seen so much energy in the company as I saw at midnight that night, let alone, you know, five o'clock in the afternoon. What, were these the same teams, was the structure the same teams that you have already? In other words, the team that would have worked on a, on a brief or something? Um, approximately. I mean, I just, like I said, I did a little reshuffling. So okay. they're all people who work on the same team now, but they may not have always worked on the same team. Okay, so, so I want you to each briefly tell me, for, you know, for other people who'd be considering doing something like this, what is the one key element you think that is the takeaway from these things that you need to do? In other words, I'm sitting down trying to structure one of these creative hackathons for my own business, right? So what's the one thing, that the, the one element from each of the ones that you did that you think is like, you gotta do this thing? I don't know, is it food, is it, you know, what was that one thing? Can you just briefly? I, I mean, definitely the project, I mean, the brief that you give them, whatever it is, whatever restraints you put on it, I think is hugely important because you, you need to appeal to them. You need it to be something that they actually will enjoy doing, and that's a huge part of it. I think for us the only uh, thing that's necessary is some level of belief that it's gonna matter. Hmm. Right, that I, we have, I think most of my team has a low tolerance for projects that aren't gonna go anywhere, because in a corporate environment that's normal. Yeah. Um, so, so, so what you're saying, when you say that, does that mean that somebody's listening? Is yeah, that another way to interpret that? that? There okay. is a potential. Uh, in our case, it's uh, essentially getting to my boss. So he's the chief. It's sort of heartbreaking. <laughs> <laughs> Sorry. <laughs> yeah, it, I should, we should do a whole nother talk on painting corporate uh, creativity is a positive thing since yeah. you know, I'm bookmarked by highly creative people that seem to be able to do whatever the hell they want. Um, no, I'm kidding. We'll, we'll get to that. Actually, we're going to get to that. Approximately. Approximately. We're going we're gonna to get to that a little bit. Uh, but the, we have, uh, when we do projects, like recently we did this thing called Tiger Blood, and it was just one Tiger of the Blood? Team. Yep. I don't know why it was called Tiger Blood. Uh, one of the teams did a series of uh, small innovation projects, and uh, the team leader asked for permission to do them. Uh, they only worked on them on Fridays, sort of the Google model. Um, the one thing they asked for was the opportunity to present every project with the possibility of it green light, being greenlighted. So we did that. We did mm -hmm. a full day presentation of a lot of our work, and we closed with the best projects from Tiger Blood. One of them was picked up by our CTO and will ship in October. 
that's huge. Uh, in a company, it is so hard to get that idea out there. Um, but they did a phenomenal job. Like your team, they made a functional prototype. Um, in this case, this is probably not giving too much away. I'm so bad at like the what's I'm not allowed to say and what I'm not allowed to say. But this thing might be physical, not digital. So huh. that mm. makes a huge difference and will change a, at least a little bit of our relationship with our customers. So it's a very exciting project. It got the entire organization you know, really charged up to go, oh my god, they did that. They were able to, because you know, normally we're a little bit downstream of the base idea. This time, mm -hmm. uh, we were at the top of it. So. I mean, I think a lot of what you said rings true to me as well. I, I uh, you know, as an agency doing a lot of sort of communications related stuff, even if those are products, they're products related to communications, we, we tend to be a little bit downstream of uh, either the overall brand or the business problem that's being solved. And I think a chance for these teams to do it on their own. And in, I think there's a big difference between invention and innovation. And what my team was doing was invention. They were, they were manifesting something out of nothing. Um, and I have a, a good friend, Brian Collins, who's an amazing designer. And he, uh, I, I once called him up and showed him a new project we had done. I was like, oh, it's just a little something, but it's kind of fun. And he said, Michael, you made something out of nothing, and that is always a small miracle. And it stays with me forever, because I really do feel like you should be, you should feel like it's a miracle when you bring something out of nothing into the world. And, uh, and I think that that was, I mean, competition certainly helps, um, friendly competition. My team, I'm really lucky because my team actually uh, want to do these things. They, they were happy to spend uh, all that time uh, working on this. It was a great challenge for them. They were excited about it. I also think a chance to prove yourself, um, sort of the personal competition, you know, the team that won, uh, none of them are really senior people with tons of experience. We had people from all ranges uh, uh, in the company, and they were four guys who, you know, they're not just starting out in their careers, but they're, they're sort of, you know, moving along. And they, what, what they had, they had a great idea, and they, they figured out exactly how to work together, and they did it really quickly. And the, the result was, you know, they're all really good at what they do. Everybody in my company is really good at what they do, but I, I I sort of believe that they, uh, they were motivated by each other as well. So there's sort of three levels of competition, the other teams, the personal competition, and also they don't want to let each other down, um, which is part of our whole sort of yeah. you know, framework in the first place of you know, take care of each other and, yeah. uh, and collaborate. But they became stakeholders in the business. I mean, almost across the board, what you're saying is that they That's become exactly stake, right. they feel like they have a sense of ownership over it, which is really interesting. But because I want to go back to what Michael Goff said about, you know, defending the big, the big company and that thing, because um, I really, you know, I want to know about the advantages that you see to staying small and how that helps you creatively, but also, you know, the advantage of being big. And I, I have to think that there are times when you guys, as smaller, as smaller companies say, I wish, if only I could, you know, do that, or if only I didn't have to deal with that. So, so I'd love to hear from you, first of all, start with what's the advantage creatively, creatively of being small for you two, and then we'll, we'll flip it around. Well, I don't think it's just a creative advantage. I mean, I think we're in a world where, where sort of velocity, high velocity is the norm, and uh, maybe sort of counterintuitively to some, I think small teams with less time produce better work, and that's, that was borne out by our hack day. I think if we had given them a week to do it, we wouldn't have seen a whole lot better results. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, and so, you know, I mean, we're 55 people, but I make the, I make the, uh, the company several smaller companies. And it doesn't matter if we end up being 500 people, because I'll always want to keep it in small, nimble groups. Because I think, you know, we, I have a thing that I stole from a friend, the two pizza rule never have a team bigger than can be fed by two pizzas. That's sort of like the, that's the basic rule. If you want to get things done, that's the way to do it. Avoid meetings, you know, avoid having to schedule people together. Mm -hmm. You're not in the meeting business, you're in the making business. Um, and that's where size that isn't organized the right way can get in your way. You know, you can, you can start having meetings about meetings. Um, 
and that's where things slow down and you start getting this sense of like, is, is my voice ever going to get heard? Um, I don't often say to myself, God, I wish we were bigger. Um, you know, I think si size is a s sort of side effect, not always a positive side effect, but a side effect of being good. Uh, but it's not really a goal in and of itself. I think I often wish that we had more sort of credibility so that we could come in higher up the, you know, the chain in things. I would love mm -hmm. to have CEOs calling me saying, what should I do here? Um, but that is not, in my world, that's not a reflection of size as much as sort of awareness and, and credibility in the world. Bonnie? I sort of feel like something ironic, for someone like me who's a graphic designer, when you get good and bigger, you stop doing the very thing that you're good at. And, and I have completely avoided that because I actually love my job. I love what I do. I don't get to do it as much as I'd like, but I've still managed to do it. And, and so I've really structured my business to allow that. Also, most of my relationships with clients are incredibly personal. Usually it's the CEO and, and it's, I talk all the time. I mean, we're just, I, I, and I can't take on more than that and do that. Mm -hmm. And I really enjoy, so I'm doing it the way I want to do it. And, and that's meant keeping it small by necessity. As soon as we ever, I mean, I've, built up more people and I'm immediately out of touch. I'm not able to work with the designers as closely. I'm w working more with the bookkeeper and I, I just, I don't enjoy that. That's not why I'm here, so. Interesting. And Adobe actually, you know, although you're big, uh, I feel like lately has moved to a structure where you've, you've sort of split things up and tried to make things smaller a little bit from <coughs> what I know about the company. Is that, is that true and, and are you trying to <coughs> create nimble teams a little bit? Yeah, I mean, it's true that we, try to replicate the startup model in certain places at certain times. But specifically to your point about the advantages of big, it's just a lever arm. I mean, I can do work that touches every creative professional on the planet. Mm -hmm. And there aren't many other places that you can do that. It's, and we couldn't do that with 12 people you know, or 15 people. It wouldn't be possible. Uh, well, why wouldn't it? Explain why would it wouldn't be possible because you've still got the marketing, you've got the, you know, you've got sort of the back end of the business working for you. Why do you need 100 people? It doesn't necessarily get the work done faster. Yeah, I was speaking less to the 100 people and more to the 10,000. Um, mm. That's where the lever arm really comes in. Yeah. So could we do our job with fewer people? Uh, it would be a different job. Uh, I was uh, part of the acquisition of uh, Macromedia. So at Macromedia, we had about, I think it was 13 people uh, on our team. And we had a charter, and these were pretty much the only designers at Macromedia, and we had a charter around innovation and only innovation. In fact, our CEO said, uh, I'll fire you if I see you talking to the desktop teams. Um, because he believed desktop software was dead. He was always kind of a little ahead of the curve. Um, and he really didn't want us to focus on that. He wanted to focus on emerging businesses, emerging mm -hmm. opportunities, and so that's what we did. Uh, at Adobe, it's a little bit different. Uh, we believed that we could make Photoshop better, that, you know, that, that it has, that hasn't run out. Uh, there, there are still opportunities to improve it, and you guys have to try CS6. This will be my only product plug. But in XD, we're intensely proud of what we were finally able to do to support that team to make that product have the kind of polish and fit and finish and the workflows that make it a, you know, a modern product. So we can still do that. That takes a lot of people and mm -hmm. it takes a lot of time. That kind of work, I don't care how inspired you are or how fast you work or you know, the, how creative you are, uh, there is still just so much detail and so many things to track down and work through. And uh, it's just, you, it's a, that, then it is body count. You really yeah. do need enough people to have the impact. Can I ask a question then? What about Pixelmator and Acorn and groups like that that have found a, a niche for themselves, granted it's a niche, but have created sort of viable alternatives to Adobe products with very small teams? It, it, it's possible to create viable alternatives. They'll always be, and this is a, a terrible term to say, they'll always be ankle biters. Um, the, <laughs> still said it. Um, and we're not, we, we don't get particularly nervous about competition from those angles. Uh, and 
I guess it's a little bit of a self-fulfilling prophecy. If you have mass, so, so in my previous life, I was at Nike. And again, we had mass. There were lots of small creative companies that could just run circles around Nike in terms of you know, uh, innovation or cool brands or interesting connections to small communities. Uh, but when you put it all together, that's something completely different. And those, all of those individual products have a really hard time putting it all together. Sure. I mean, I think... Do you use them? Are you using Pixelmator now for... I don't use anything anymore. Yeah. <laughs> I mean, That's if I need question. to, I'll open up the, those. I actually think there's a lot of room for lightweight tools. Yes. And so do we, by the way. Yeah, I know. I know. <laughs> I'll, I'll, I'll start using Creative Suite in the cloud, I'm sure. Um, but I also but I think. I just got 5.5. <laughs> <laughs> I'll have your people talk to me. <laughs> but I also think, I mean, you, really good you know, size. You know, size is incredibly powerful, but we've also seen Microsoft give way to Google, Google already kind of not giving way, but certainly sort of turning the crown over to Facebook. And it's happening in tighter mm -hmm. and tighter uh, uh, sort of cycles because once everything's in the cloud, there's no physical product anymore and things move very quickly. And so small can displace big more rapidly by being more rapid. Yeah. There's critical mass and there's just mass. And you're right, uh, the, our move into the cloud is happening with tons of companies moving into the cloud, especially light, small, you know, the Instagrams of the world or the Dropboxes of the mm -hmm. world. Those are companies that are gonna be intensely competitive uh, with our offerings. Uh, but we do offer something slightly different, which is connecting all those parts. Yeah. It's always going to be hard. And I know the open source community has tried really hard to uh, uh, figure out a way to connect those dissimilar parts. Uh, and I hope they're successful. But at Adobe, all we do is start open sourcing more, right? Mm -hmm. Then we're connected to. There, for every challenge uh, that comes up, whether it's uh, now your challenge is small size. Now your challenge is uh, light and fast. Now your challenge is the behemoths, because we compete with Google and Microsoft just as much as we compete with uh, the Pixelmators or the other sure. small shops. Uh, there has to be a response. I mean, I, I'm not trying to defend size. Uh, all I'm saying is that when you have it, um, first of all, you're stuck with it. That's one of the big <laughs> challenges, right? Yeah. Like if you're in Adobe, the only thing you can do is grow. You, in yep. fact, you have to. That's yep. expected. It's a mandate. Investors, yeah, there's a mandate to continue to grow. And then you have to use that leverage to its advantage. Mm -hmm. yeah. there, there are some surprising places where, you know, whether you're big or small, you, you face the same challenge. And one of the main ones is consensus, right? Which, which I think everyone here agrees is actually the, the, the worst thing, right? Dealing with consensus. So I, I'd love to hear you each talk about how you push through the consensus wall and get your vision, you know, sold essentially to the stakeholders. Um, Michael, you want to start down there? And well, I mean, uh, you know, fundamentally, if you're going to work at Big Spaceship, you need to be able to have an opinion and state it. And you don't have to state it verbally. Some people are, uh, are better at describing things because they sketch or, uh, or finding reference someplace in the world. But you have to kind of bring, you have to bring your opinion to the table. And for me, that means bringing your personality mm -hmm. to the table. I, I, I think, uh, I said it on a panel yesterday, uh, I think professionalism is a very pernicious thing. Uh -huh. I think people need to be professional in the workplace, but professionalism is kind of sanding down all the rough edges of personality until you have almost nothing left. Everybody's a company man kind of thing. And I want real people. I need real people in order to function. And, uh, you know, and I think that that, in a way, kind of, you know, I mean, certainly everybody's pretty nice to each other. It doesn't have to be, uh, it doesn't have to be acrimonious to be sort of strong-minded, mm -hmm. and I think, you know, a little bit of competition, a little bit of argument is great uh, well, what, because of differences of opinion. But let's flip it around. What about your clients? I mean, that's, I, I would, it strikes me that that's probably where you come up with, you know, unlike Michael, who might be, have to deal with consensus internally, you probably more have to deal with consensus when you're dealing with the people that you're supposed to be making creative work for. Yes. So how None do you, how do you overcome that? clients, but many clients <laughs> yeah, in the past. Yeah, of course, of course. <laughs> <laughs> um, 
Yeah, I mean, I think we, uh, there's a little bit of sort of, uh, I learned the expression from TV, baiting the censors. So if you want to get away with one asshole in your, you know, 10 o'clock broadcast show, you put four or five assholes in, in uh, or, you know, fucks or ass or whatever the, the you know, yeah. the going, FCC please. words, <laughs> you know, and, uh, and, and one is more likely to get through. Yep. So, you know, the way we do things like that is we'll, we'll have sort of the, the safer approach, but we'll also try to put something that's more ambitious out there and we'll lead with it and we'll talk about why we think it's really successful. And invariably, even if we end up with a safe approach, we'll kind of get to pull in some of the more ambitious things. I think ultimately it's, it's a little bit of a battle of attrition. I mean, if you want to have, if you want to do these things, you have to build trust and it's about relationships. And you're not gonna get to, you know, completely reinvent a client's business the first time you work with them. Mm -hmm. So, uh, you know, each time you push them a little further and you'll, uh, you know, eventually get there, knock wood. Bonnie, I wanted to ask you because you've worked with some um, very big uh, creative people, I don't know, dare I say egos, um, you know, in yes. the world. Uh, and, you know, right now working with even the Frank Lloyd Wright Foundation, which obviously is, you know, has a, a kind of singular vision that it's based on, um, Newsweek, The Daily Beast. Talk about how, you know, you're almost, you, you, there's consensus, but in some ways maybe you're more dealing with, with another person who's got an idea yeah. and you need to <laughs> convince which, them but, somehow. But that's also, that's collaboration in a way. I mean, that's uh -huh. two people working together with a shared vision or a shared goal. The problem, the evil of consensus is when in a corporation, there's different people from different departments, each with their own agenda and hoping the solution will meet their agenda. They don't really care about the other people's agenda. Yeah. And so when they evaluate a solution, they're really looking out for number one. And then the consensus is, well, if we take away the arm and one of the legs and add another nose, yeah. then we'll solve all the problems. And of course, that hole is less then you know, it, it fails miserably. There's no way to build a good creative idea from differing objectives coming together and compromising. So, so how do you get through it? What do, what do you do? What are your techniques for breaking through that, that consensus? So in the few times I've been in a situation like that at, at a table with all these differing opinions, we ask everyone to fully articulate their agenda and their needs, which, you know, ideally should have happened already a long time ago before we began. So it, if it happens at that point, I've done something wrong. I also talk to, I make sure we're dealing with one voice, if at all possible. I mean, sometimes there's more than one owner of the company, but there should be a point person. So at least all the opinions are funneled through that person. It's just really hard to get differing voices. And then if there's one person speaking, they know how absurd it is when they say, well, one person wants it red, one person wants it green, and one person wants it blue, what can you do? I mean, they, they hear it, whereas if each person is giving us their opinion individually, mm -hmm. it just feels like each person's opinion is just as valid as the other. So, but I will take everybody's opinion and then come back and say, considering all of the different, differing opinions, this is the strongest solution. Michael Lebowitz, I want to go back to you for just a second because you had also talked about uh, defining the problem. Thank you. Defining the problem really clearly uh, was part of it, which, it, which strikes me as part of what Bonnie's saying as well yes. is get them to define, get them to tell you the problem up front in a, in a room together so that they all hear it, right? Exactly. Yeah, I mean, it's, uh, it's amazing how many assumptions people don't realize that they've made by the time they're calling you. And, uh, and they wonder why you say there's not enough time to accomplish your goals. But um, it, it's, uh, you know, trying to get to the point where somebody is actually explaining the business problem behind things uh, is a arduous but worthwhile task, especially if you can get them to say it all, if there are multiple stakeholders in front of each other. Um, it's great also, you know, if you're workshopping with a client to get those individual motivations. I mean, I think, you know, if you're going to get something through, you need to have a level of chemistry and understanding of the people you're working with. You know, what does somebody want for themselves in their career? Uh, you know, th those are things, you're not sort of building that into your output, but it's really good to understand the motivations of people so you know how to speak to them. Because I think most of these issues are issues of uh, contextualization. You know, getting them to see, as, uh, uh, as you just said, that, that you know, 
that some things might be ridiculous when you can kind of pull it all together, but making sure that, that they feel like you understand them enough that you can say that's ridiculous without it seeming like a challenge to their, uh, their you know, career and personal ambitions. Yeah. I feel like we've been a little problem focused. The one thing I really wanted to say is that yeah. there, there hasn't been, so I've been a professional for 20, 30, 30 something years, and there hasn't been a better time to be a creative professional. I mean, that for some reason, the people who are primarily run by logic um, and other disciplines have figured out that creative professionals bring something to the table that works. Um, and they're not always sure why, and they're not always sure how to support it, but it's obvious to them that that's the, like the current game changer. A couple of years ago, what that meant was they were trying to treat, teach business people how to be creative thinkers. We all know how that was going to go. Um, now they're asking us for our opinion. They're asking us to lead. And I like to tell my team that we get to bring guns to knife fights, because somebody shows up with an Excel spreadsheet, a bunch of numbers on it, somebody shows up with a PowerPoint presentation with a bunch of platitudes on it, and we bring a fully functioning prototype. Who's going to win? We're going to win. The best ideas are going to come from the people sitting in this room, from people who are focused on uh, the power of creative thinking. That's great. We're just about out of time. Is there, do I have enough time for one or two questions, or do we need, okay. Any questions out there for the panel? Anyone? Well, then I'll keep going, although that was a great, uh, I, I really like that ending. So uh, we were talking about this, you know, creativity as a key success factor, and I love that idea that creativity can break through consensus. But my question is, you know, why do we need creativity, like more creative people in the world, I guess, is, is the question. You know, there's, there, that's underlying this assumption of creativity as a sex, success factor in business, and that's how you're gonna break through. Do we, do we need more creative people? Should we, should we be out there pushing more? Everybody should be creative. I mean, business is creative. Uh, it, it's not, necessar not necessarily taught that way, or you're not sort of acculturated to it that way. I had to learn business by falling on my face a lot of times, but that's a creative process. You fall on your face. We talked about it at the beginning. Yeah. You fall on your face a lot of times, and then you figure out how to deal with it. I think, you know, I've said for a long time that what my industry needs more than anything else is a visionary lawyer, you know? <laughs> Somebody who's going to cut through risk mitigation and into strategy enablement you know, that would be a creative lawyer. It doesn't mean that that lawyer is then going to go off and do graphic design or really understand the history of typography, but that lawyer is going to be creative by learning how to enable, by working with some of the soft stuff instead of all of the rigorous hard stuff. Mm -hmm. And, you know, ultimately we're kind of in a world where everybody needs to be working towards enabling uh, rather than just sort of mitigating and, uh, and, and naysaying. Uh, because you know the world moves too fast to kind of always have to like stop completely and reroute, and that's how most things get watered down in the world. And you know, when when Apple is the most valuable company in the world, and a lot of the reason for it was that Steve Jobs would not accept anything but the people around him enabling his vision mm -hmm. rather than saying, well, there's, you know, there's a lot of legal risk to not putting 17 stickers on each box. Uh, you know, he, he created value at a level that's never been seen before. So I think it's very clear. Right. We're, we're out of time. Do you, do, you, do you want to say any last thing quickly about that? The only thing I just want to add is I think it all goes back to education, which is completely linear. There's right answers mm -hmm. to everything. And until that changes, it's still going to be hard to find that creative lawyer because getting the lawyer got the right answer all along yeah. and that encouraged him to continue to do that. He always wants the right answer without questioning outside. So I feel like until, and look Steve, Jobs dropped out of school, I mean, we have to change the way we teach so that it allows for someone to come up with the wrong answer and figure out why that might be the right answer. I, I was going to say linear logical thinking has taken us really, really far. So for the, I don't know, the last thousand years, that's been the power. You know, how, mu how logically can we get from point A to, I don't know, nuclear weapons? Um, now we have a bunch of challenges that it doesn't appear logic is going to be able to solve. Mm -hmm. And that's where design thinking, which is a component of creativity, mm -hmm. uh, comes in. And that's where I'm most excited. And a panel about design thinking would actually be even more fun than a panel <laughs> about creativity. So. <laughs> 
Thanks, everyone. Thank you. Thanks. Thank you.